Welcome to Defending the Faith. We've had we've invited our brother again. It's becoming a, a habit forming thing. He's done such a great job. Uh, he's going to talk about the Christian life today. So we're going to turn it over to our brother and Pastor Vernon Lyons. Uh, and perhaps you've caught on. We're in a mini series here. The first one was What is a Christian? The last one was What is a Church? Now, today, I want to discuss with you, what is the Christian life? There are many ideas on this, but really, uh, there are just two, very simple, two aspects to the Christian life. There is the inward aspect, and there is the outward aspect aspect, the private part of the Christian life and the public aspect of the Christian life. When we're talking about the inward part of the Christian life, we're talking about the heart, not the physical heart, of course, that pumps the blood through our veins. That's very important. But the word heart appears 777 times in the Bible. And with very few exceptions, it's referring to the heart in the non-material, non-physical sense. By that, we mean... Uh, what is the heart then? It, it really is you. It's your thinking. It's your feelings, all of your feelings, your emotions. It's your choices, your decisions. It's everything wrapped up in what is you. It's you as a person. It's your personality. Uh, in psychological terms, it's that immaterial, non-material aspect. Really, it's you. You understand that your body is not you. That uh, you live in your body. And uh, so when there's death, it's the body that dies. You are living on and uh, you will last forever. So obviously, our bodies are on a timer. Uh, someone says, I'm over the hill. Well, uh, finally, if, since you're at the bottom of the hill and your time is up on this earth, but that doesn't mean that you don't exist anymore. So heart in the Bible and often in our common use, we say someone has a hard heart. Or another person, he has a soft heart. We're talking about not his body, not his physical heart, but about himself. One passage of scripture that's very clear on this is 1 Samuel 16. The prophet Samuel was sent by God down to Bethlehem to anoint the next king, the person who's to be king after Saul. And he's to go to the house of Jesse. And uh, the sons of Jesse start appearing before Samuel. Eliab, uh, Abinadab, Shammah, and oh, they are nice fellows. They all look kingly. And uh, Samuel's confused because uh, the Lord is saying, not this one, not this one, not this one. Every one of them was a real specimen of manhood. Someone today like would be a, a model for sportswear. Well, uh, don't you have any others? So they fetch David. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that the Lord does not look as man looks. Man looks says the text, at the outward appearance. We do. 
But God looks at the heart, the heart, at you, at who you really are, how you think, how you feel, how you act. Now, the Bible says some interesting things about the heart. The heart, that is, we as persons were born, of course, and from birth, we are sinners. And uh, that's just it. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Oh, my. And Jesus said in Mark 7, starting with verse 21, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. What a mess we are as people. But there's good news. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart. That's referring to the new birth that Jesus talked about with Nicodemus in John 3. I'll give you a new heart. We are born again. And we get a, a different inside. Our feelings are changed. Our goals are changed. Our thinking is changed. And so, but all of that starts just like the trouble was inside. That, that long list of 13 items that Jesus gave. Or Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked. So God changes the heart. And only he has the power to do that. That's the new life. That's being born again. And that's why it says in Proverbs 23 and, uh, and 23 that my son, or 27 I think it is, uh, 23, my son, give me your heart. God wants you. He wants control of your life. He wants control of you. And it all starts on the inside. And a new life, when you are born into the family of God and get a new nature and a new heart. It says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse, where is it, 22, uh, that uh, a, our heart, it says, a merry heart is good. A joyful heart is good, like a medicine. Oh, my. So it's important where your thoughts are, where your feelings are, where your thinking is, because <laughs> it, it's like a good medicine and always... Uh, pe people are going to the drugstore trying to find something that makes them feel better. You have it already if you have a joyful heart. There you have it. Uh, Dr. Nelson, a fine Christian physician uh, who was our family physician for a while, I was in to see him one day with my wife. She had to see him about something. And I asked him, he was a member of Elam Baptist Church. I said, Dr. Nelson, of all the maladies that afflict the people that you see, and the list is long, how many of them start with bad thinking? He said, oh, at least, he said, at least 70%. Oh, you would be healthier if your thinking was right, if your outlook was better. And it's all in the heart. There you make the decisions. Daniel, it says of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart. 
Ah, decisions are made within, and you, you decide and on all these things. That's what it's all about. It says in, in Proverbs 23, 7, that uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's amazing. And you can, you can determine, you, you see, it's not what someone does to you. It's how you receive it. Not what someone says to you, but how you hear it. You control that from within. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Somebody asked me, how are you doing? I said, I'm just fine today. I'm having a good day. I had a good day yesterday. And by the way, I'm going to have a good day tomorrow. You say, how do you know that? Well, uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I'm going to have, you say, what if you break your leg tomorrow? Well, I'm not going to let that tear up my whole life. My other leg is still good. And you say, what if you are killed in an automobile collision tomorrow? Oh, that's the best day. Now I'm in heaven. You see, I cannot lose. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And a merry heart, a joyful heart, is like a good, a good medicine. There it is, and that's the way it works. So what you are inside is going to determine the whole course of your life. There's no question about it. You have a control, you see that you're unaware of. And it's not what takes place. What takes place in Washington doesn't need to, or Springfield, Illinois, need to tear up your whole life. What goes on at work if you have a grumpy boss, let him enjoy his own grumpiness by himself. Mm -hmm. You do not need to let that impact you. You say, I'm in a bad marriage. Well, you're half of it, and uh, if you determine to make things go well, it's amazing how they will improve. You have control over that. And your partner, your spouse, may improve considerably if, if you do. And so it's really up to you. And it's, it's on you, you see, because a merry heart does good like a medicine. And there are all kinds of, of problems, physical problems, that you won't have uh, if you allow yourself to control your thinking. You've heard somebody say of another person, He's a pain in the neck. Oh, you allowed him to be a pain in your neck. That's what. And that can be literally true. Uh, and uh, so what people say or do is not that important, but it's how you think. As a man thinks in his heart, a merry heart does good like a medicine. Now, we find in the scripture uh, a very important text in Deuteronomy and uh, chapter 6, verse 5 it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's your relationship to God. And if you are rightly related to God, you will love him. Jesus, on Tuesday of Easter week, was asked a question. Really, they were trying to trap him, to catch him, when those Pharisees asked him, what? is the greatest, Matthew 22, 
Uh, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. Oh, oh, that was a minefield. And the rabbis were always arguing about what's the greatest commandment in the law. Because in the Old Testament, there were 613 commandments. One rabbi would latch on to one and say, that's the most important, another, and has still had another commandment. So they're trying to catch Jesus. And he said, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, you shall love the Lord the God, your God with all your heart. Now, if you do that, you are rightly related to God. And of all the relationships we have, that is the most important, to love God. Now, if you love God, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, you'll obey him. You will be concerned with what he wants. You will be concerned with bringing glory, not to yourself, but to God. And when you do that, when you're rightly related with God, it's amazing how your other relationship smooth out. So the vertical relationship, the one to God, is important. Then the horizontal relationships smooth out and get along very, very well. So what you are inwardly, and that's it, we're talking, what is the Christian life? It primarily and first of all, it is inward. It's what goes on within you and between you and God. That's, that's what counts, and that's it. And when, when that's straight, then other things work out all right, and you'll be, you'll be okay. And, but your relationship with God is of primary importance. How, how, do you, how do you cultivate this? Well, it's important that you're in the Word of God daily. You need to saturate your soul with Scripture. You need to soak your heart in the Word of God. That's what's important. And when you do that, then it's amazing because here it is in the Scripture. Uh, God tells you everything he wants you to know. The Bible is really, has only two subjects. Uh, no matter where you read, keep asking yourself two questions. Wherever you're reading in the Bible, what does this tell me about God? Who he is? What's he thinking? What's he doing? That's number one. The other subject in the scripture is you. Uh, he tells, uh, tells about you. And uh, so you need to find out about yourself. Before anyone ever heard of psychology, the Bible was the textbook on psychology. Now, you will never fully understand God. That's impossible. But you will catch on to all you need to know by reading about him. Everything he wants you to know about himself is in the scripture. And everything he wants you to know about yourself, you can skip the psychology course. Everything you need to know about yourself is here in, in, the, in, in the Bible. So keep asking two questions as you read the Bible. 
and just saturate your soul with it. What is this passage, this chapter, this verse telling me about God? What is this passage telling me about myself? And then love God with all your heart and for all your worth. And then it will, it will turn out all right if you do that. But you must do that. And then there's something else. You must, it says in Proverbs uh, 4, uh, 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Oh, everything springs from inside. Take care of your inner person. And uh, we're going to run out of time, so next time we're going to talk about the outward aspect of the Christian life. But now the inward part, which is most important, because that's going to determine the outward part, you see. So it is. Now then. Uh, keep your heart with all diligence. So, in the Word and in prayer, listen to God. I think sometimes we think prayer is just asking. No. Prayer is submission to God, to His will, which you find in this book, in the Scripture. And then it's amazing what great kind of life you will have. Paul describes this inward life in Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. A Christian life is a rejoicing life. Murmuring, no. Scratch it off the list. Complaining, what's there to complain about? Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. When Paul wrote that to the church at Philippi, the hand that held the quill had around the wrist an iron band, and attached to the iron band was a chain. On the other end of that chain was a Roman guard. Paul was a prisoner. A prisoner. And he's saying rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Well, that's tending the inner person, your inner self, your real self. And the circumstances will not control your thoughts. No matter what your condition is, the content of your thoughts is what's important. So that the circumstances in which you find yourself have nothing to do with what kind of person you are. The circumstances may be terrible. Uh, nothing you'd ask for, nothing you would want, but they're unimportant because the control is inward and how you react to those circumstances is going to be determined on what your, your thoughts are inwardly. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And it is amazing when you are a confident, rejoicing, controlled inwardly from your heart kind of person, then it is that others will be drawn to you and you can be a blessing to them. And so, 
as we think about the Christian life. There's the inward part, and next time we'll get to the outward part. But the inward part will determine everything else. And the Bible is heavy and helpful on this. And you'll find here resources without limit that you can utilize in your life. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, no evil can befall you. The devil, <laughs> you're beyond his reach because you're not giving in to what people do to you or say about you. You're not giving in to whatever your circumstances may be at the moment. You may be lying in a hospital bed. You may be uh, uh, looking at your finances and determining that it is going to be miserable. You're going to live almost in poverty. Yet, you're not touched by this. Paul had an abundance of trouble in his life. But he was the one who said, rejoice. And again, I say unto you, rejoice. So the Christian life is, first of all, an inward life. You're thinking, you're feeling, and this you control. Someone may hate you, but you don't have to hate him. Actually, and if you hate someone, the hatred will hurt you more than the other person. So it's a love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit who is given to you. And that's the Christian life. Stop.